Tuesday, May 3rd City Commission work session. Um, feels like a Monday. Uh, we'll call our meeting to order. Um, and real quick, join me in wishing um, Commissioner Franey a happy birthday. And Nikki, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Nikki. All right, we've got some presentations this morning. And for anybody that might be here on behalf of our workshop item, the Artisan Incubator, um, that item has been continued to some time in the future. Do we have a date? I do not have a date. No. Okay. All right, then. Um, so I just didn't want you all to sit in the audience the whole time waiting to hear that. We'll move on to our presentations. Our first presentation is recognition of International Economic Development Week. And I will turn that over to Commissioner Franey. Yes, um, uh, I'm not sure who's coming up to accept this. Would it be Bob, Bob and Jeannie, both? Absolutely. Our gurus. Thank you, and happy birthday. Yeah, thank you, it's actually yesterday, so. But. Yeah. Well, you get two days. Cool, yeah. Maybe all week. Take a month. <laughs> all month. Yes, I'm taking the week, I'm taking the week, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, International Economic Development Week, May 9th through the 13th, 2022, with the quote, economic development touches all things, right? It's all about yes. economics. Whereas economic development is a process that is strengthened by the critical partnership between economic development professionals and local government leadership to promote a shared vision for developing vibrant communities. And whereas economic developers promote economic well-being and quality of life for their communities by helping to create, retain, and expand jobs that sustain individuals and families, enhance wealth, and provide a stable tax base. <laughs> and where, okay, they're trying to get in already to, yeah. <laughs> Whereas in partnership with industries, educators, and other key allies, economic developers cultivate and nurture entrepreneurship and help secure the next generation of new businesses, foster an effective business climate, and meet the increasingly critical need for a skilled and competitive workforce. And whereas economic developers are engaged in a wide variety of settings, including rural and urban, local, state, and federal governments, and public-private partnerships, such as the Dunedin Chamber of Commerce, Dunedin uh, Down Downtown Dunedin Merchants Association, Visit Dunedin, and a variety of other businesses, associations, and institutions. And whereas economic developers attract and retain high quality jobs, develop vibrant communities, support small businesses and entrepreneurs, and improve the quality of life in their regions. Now, therefore, I, Maureen Mofraney, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the mayor of the city of Dunedin, Florida, now on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby designate May 9th through the 13th, 2022 as International Economic Development Week and urge all citizens to recognize the efforts of the Economic and Housing Development CRA Department and all our economic development partners and reaffirm the importance of business development. And that is it. Thank and you. Bob, if you want to come up. Uh, this, this will obviously be framed and go in the new city hall. So <laughs> um, be, be, before, you, before you make your comments, I'm just going to say that um, you too, I'm glad you both are up there, but you have a total team in your department, but you and Jeannie, uh, you guys do a great job. And of course, Bob, you've been here a long, long time. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> yeah. Careful. Yeah. Well, we, we, we've seen the improvements here and, and just, uh, it doesn't just happen. You know, it, it takes seeds, it takes a lot of nurturing and, and you're, you and you guys and the department do a great job. So just want to thank you and let you have a chance to say some things. Uh, oh, certainly, thank you. And Trevor would be here, but Trevor's out. So he's obviously an, uh, an integral part of the team and makes downtown happen. And, and one, we, we are so thankful for the commitment, you know, from the city commission and, and my boss across the city manager and all the staff really in the city contributes to all the things that we do. And I think a lot of people think economic development is business retention and expansion. And of course, we use that line, touches all things. You can see that in a very brief video coming up. But you know, we're doing affordable housing, we're doing artistic bus shelters, we're doing infrastructure, we're doing parks, we're, we're touching a lot of things with a whole group of, of staff and people that come into play. And of course, those other organizations, the merchants and the, and the chambers. So it's nice to be able to make a difference. And we really appreciate all, uh, all the support. 
Jeannie and Trevor, you know, I, I'm lucky to have two stars on my team, so these guys are fantastic, so I can't say enough things, uh, good things about them. But communications, uh, thanks to Sue Antonella and, uh, and, and Justin and Seth. Uh, we have a quick little video for you. It's, it's very short, just to kind of show uh, what we're doing. And, and, of course, we've got some big things coming up, too, right, some big projects. The complete streets on Skinner is, is one. And, of course, uh, we're looking at our great crosswalk, Coming up here soon, I promise you, on Douglas too, mm -hmm. with lights that we want to see happen. <laughs> yeah, I know that's been a long time waiting. So we got a lot of good things happening. And again, thank you for all the commitment of you and, and, and the city manager toward what we do. So, Justin, can you run that video for us? Oh, please, in the background, can you hear that? In the city of Dunedin, economic development touches all things. We create a very fertile business and cultural environment that encourages and promotes private investment, business recruitment, business retention, as well as promoting tourism and things that improve the quality of life in the city of Dunedin for those that live, work, and play here. Economic development improves the fabric of the community of Dunedin with complete streets, creating a safe environment for bicycles, pedestrians, and vehicles. Economic development provides the resources for Dunedin's cultural and artistic aesthetics which creates a sense of place that is uniquely Dunedin. Economic development provides an environment for entrepreneurs to thrive. That is the Dunedin vibe. It's the spirit of community working together. Economic development touches all things, but most importantly, it's the economic engine that generates revenue to provide for world-class amenities and services for those that live, work, and play in the city of Dunedin, Florida. I know I mentioned it just quickly. Trevor wishes he was here. The one day he wouldn't want to miss, it'd be this day. But he, he uh, had a commitment he had to do. So, but anyway, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all your hard work. Very good. So, if I could just say that communications department's making everybody look good these days. <laughs> thank God, right? Yes, they are. <laughs> we are, Gina, very, Gina, we are very proud of them mm -hmm. as well. All right, next on our agenda is our National EMS Week Proclamation, and I will turn that over to Commissioner Gow. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, certainly, the CRA is always a hard act to follow, but I think we can beat it with uh, EMS. You can beat care. everything with EMS. Absolutely. <laughs> come on up, everybody. Come on. Everybody. Everybody. Come on, step forward, please, so we can see all of you. From four to me, Ricky. All right. Welcome, Plenty gentlemen. Plenty of room. Oh, my goodness. Wow. They're right there. They're, they're we're in the right place right now for station. medical emergency. Right. Yeah. <laughs> something happens. Yeah, we're good. I say, if something happens here today, this is the day. <laughs> Get everybody to take care of. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you guys for all showing up. Absolutely. Right. EMS Week 2022. Whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service. And whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rates of those ex who, who experience sudden illness or injury. And whereas emergency medical services have grown to fulfill a gap by providing important out of hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine. And whereas the emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public, and other out-of-hospital medical care providers. And whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and accomplishments of emergency medical services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Now, therefore, I, Jeff Gao,
by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the mayor of the city of Dunedin and on behalf of the entire city commission do hereby designate the week of May 15th through the 22nd as Emergency Medical Services Week with the theme EMS, Rising to the Challenge, and encourage the community to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for the recognition. And uh, Chief Zapetto is going to speak on us there, but I'd like to thank all of our folks behind us here, they, day in, day out. They're out there answering the calls when people have an emergency. So we're very proud of the work that they all do in Dunedin. Thank you. I don't have a video. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Stop. That's okay. We see you in action. <laughs> That's right. He does have a 30 minute. <laughs> hey, we have time today, right? We don't need no film. <laughs> no, th thank you all. Uh, after the last couple of years, it feels good to, to be able to stand here and uh, face to face to make this proclamation together. Uh, we've been through a lot. Illness, pain, frustration, and unfortunately loss. This year's EMS week is titled Rising to the Challenge, and boy have they. Since President Gerald Ford declared the first EMS week in 1974, I believe EMS workers have been rising to the challenge every day. I believe we all know and appreciate what our first responders do for us day in and day out. But does anyone know what it takes to get here? In 1974, it was a very limited 400-hour <laughs> program in select cities, and paramedics were referred to as an EMTP. Today, the state of Florida recognizes EMT and paramedic as separate certifications with different requirements. Both are college level courses earning an individual four year degree if they wish. EMTs start with 110 hours of classroom followed by at least 20 hours externship and 10 hours in the hospital. This will earn them about four credit hours in college. Paramedics, this is where the fun starts, following EMT school, and 20 hours of prerequisites, students begin a 12-month program where they endure over 700 hours of lecture, skills, and labs. Then they begin a minimum 540 hours of externship. If they want to go on to be a firefighter, well, that's another 492 hours at college or academy. So as you can see, it's a true commitment for hopefully a long career. These caring, motivated, and courageous people rise to the challenge at every turn and are true professionals in the week, every week of the year. Thank you for taking the time to recognize us, and uh, may you all have a productive and good day. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your service to this community. We truly appreciate it. Commission, before it. they leave, can I ask them to stay up here? Sure. I think we would all like for them to stay up. I'm going to be doing the water safety. The month, what? The water safety month. Oh, sure. For 2022, do you mind? Vince. And Vince? <coughs> Vince? Yes. Alicia. Alicia's going to be doing yes. Alicia's, yeah. Would you bring uh, all, your entire staff up here? Because this is really important stuff, and, and this is really important to us as a coastal city. In fact, I was even going to suggest maybe you go down there, but that's Thank you. I'm, I'm here to read the Water Safety Month 2022, and the safety side includes not only prevention, but then action when it's required. And so, if I may, whereas the city of Dunedin is committed to ensuring the safety of all residents and visitors to our great city, and whereas residents and tourists alike enjoy our city's natural water resources and mad made recreational water facilities, and whereas swimming and aqua, uh, aquatic related activities play a vital role in good physical and mental health and enhance the quality of life for all residents and visitors, and whereas the, city, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that annually there are an estimated 3,960 fatal unintentional drownings, including boating-related drowning, averaging 11 drowning deaths per day, and 8,000 
and 80 non-fatal drownings, averaging 22 non-fatal drownings per day. And whereas more children ages one through four die from drowning than any other cause of death except for birth defects, and for children ages one through 14, drowning is the second leading cause of unintentional injury death after motor vehicle crashes. Whereas comprehensive water safety education is essential for everyone, including children, parents, and caregivers to be aware of water safety rules and programs to help prevent drownings and recreational water-related injuries. And whereas basic water safety tips include always having adult supervision of children, providing children swimming lessons at a young age, installing barriers when a child or vulnerable adult has uninterrupted access to a body of water, and everyone, especially caregivers, should learn CPR and have safety equipment, such as emergency flotation devices. And whereas, Water Safety Month in Dunedin is an opportunity to promote water safety as well as provide education in our coastal community regarding prevention of recreational water-related injuries, illnesses, and deaths. Now, therefore, I, John Torniger, by the virtue of the authority invested in the mayor of the city of Dunedin, Florida, and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Water Safety Month in Dunedin and encourage all residents to take the pledge to be safe swimmers and make water safety a priority. And as I mentioned, as I mentioned for the entire team that's okay. up here, we have, we have two situations. One where these, these folks do it all. They try to make sure these people are, are, are that our entire residents and those that are visiting us that are enjoying some of the man, particularly the man-made, uh, oh. learn how to do some of these things. And you all, I just heard of another one where you were all involved in for a rescue. So we really appreciate what you do in, uh, in, in support of our residents and our visitors uh, for the for the water situation here in Dunedin and a wonderful coastal city that we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Commission, for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you about Water Safety Month. My name is Alicia Castricone, Program Coordinator, and with me is Stephanie Kensinger, the Head Lifeguard and Department Director Vince Gizzi. I would like to share with you a brief slideshow of some of our water safety accomplishments as we are very interested in education and safety and all those good things. So it might work. Okay. So this is the Every Child a Swimmer program. We started this program back in 2009 with the Kiwanis Club of Dunedin. And up to uh, this year, we have served 1,200 uh, children. So they have been trained to be safe in and around the water, and their families have um, been given water safety education measures as well. So, and you can see some other pretty photos. There we go. Yeah, together. One there we go. <laughs> and then that one was um, during. For, uh, the pandemic time where we had to wear the little face shields. That was a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is the uh, Florida Sheriff's Youth Ranch. Um, we work with them um, whenever they're available to have us there, and we teach their, um, I guess, campers. <laughs> um, we teach classes for them and so far we've taught uh, over a hundred children how to swim there. So. Great. so during the pandemic we were not able to do the Every Child at Swimmer program so we thought you know what we're going to do something else. Um, with the rising numbers of drowning rates uh, during that time we said you know what something has to be done. So we created the child safety drive-through, where they drive through the um, the old fire station, and they are fitted for life jackets. That was actually a very successful 
event, we fitted 212 children with uh, life jackets. So that hopefully kept them safe. Um, then we also made sure that families went home with water safety information as well. Um, you can see I'm there with a uh, poster and throughout their drive before they come up and around was a lot of water safety posters that we had made so they could see them. So, And you can see all the hard work that went involved in that. And then there's the happy faces. <laughs> Then this year we decided, okay, let's pop up all over Dunedin, why don't we? Um, so we created six or seven different locations throughout Dunedin where we popped up and we fitted um, about 100 children with life jackets and gave out um, door alarms, uh, information about being safe in and around the water, those types of things. And there's the happy faces. Aww. Very excited. That was at Weaver Park there. This is in downtown by the museum. <laughs> so see, these are some of the books that we would give out in our safety um, bags. So Josh the Otter, it's, it really emphasizes those, uh, for those that are on the spectrum, it helps um, teach families that those that are on the spectrum, you know, have a higher um, incident of going towards the water because it attracts them. So this book is really good um, for those who do have children in that area. The S Swim Safer Little Seals um, was actually, it's a really uh, illustrated book, really nice. It goes over a lot of the rules and things, especially not going near the water. Uh, this book, this is Stewie the Duck Learns to Swim. This is a very uh, special book to me because it was written by the family who lost a child in 1989. So Little Stewie is the little duck that teaches all the things that we can learn uh, to be safe in and around the water. So that was a very special one to me. And then this, this is the Hot Little Water Watcher Badge, um, which I'm going to talk about. We have some educational pieces that I wanted to share regarding how to be safe in and around the water. So the first one is layers of protection. So if you have a pool, you want to have a, a fence bordering that pool. And then you want to have a pool top lock so that the little ones can't reach it. You also want to make sure that there's nothing in the area so the kids don't climb and unlock it as well. And then keeping items out of the pool. So if there's toys in the pool, it's going to attract children to that water and they're going to find a way to get there even if you have a pool top lock. So um, just take those things out so they aren't attracted. Also have a first aid kit. Um, in the first aid kit, you want to have it labeled um, in a very accessible location. Uh, have a CPR mask and a rescue ready card in case CPR has to be performed until EMS arrive and take over. If you'd like to take a CPR class, you're welcome to do so by going to redcross.org. The water watcher badge, which everyone should have, this water watcher badge, um, during times of swim, while wearing the badge, undivided attention should be given if you or other parents are, are in, you know, like it's a party or something, create shifts. Each parent, while wearing the badge, has to be free of conversation, phone, and other distractions during their shift. When the shift is over and the next parent takes over, discuss any issues noted or if a child is getting tired. Um, so if anyone would like a free water watcher badge, they can come see us at Highlander Pool. We have hundreds of them that we can give out to you. Then next would be educating the families on water safety. At times, other family members are watching the children. It could be the grandparents, aunts, uncles. It is important that you educate them on water safety and explain the layers of protection if they do have a pool. Make sure they also have a well-stocked first aid kit and understand the water, watch, water Watcher Badge Initiative. Get swim lessons. That's super important. Um, not only will it teach children the skills of swimming, but it also teaches them how to be safe and around the water. Highlander Pool is offering swim lessons for ages six months to adult. We also offer the infant survival resources with our instructor, Jan Orwick. So there's no excuse to get a swim lesson with us. 
And then lastly, when you're out and about, use proper flotation, okay? The best flotation devices for children are the ones that are Coast Guard approved. All approved life jackets or puddle jumpers will have the Coast Guard approved emblem um, or statement on the device. And with those, those things, you should have a fantastic swim season. Thank you. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for protecting our kids. I love the books. Mm -hmm. I love that, you know, you can learn through reading your books, right. too, that sort of intersection of safety sure. and literature. I, I think, you know, Alicia, you know, it sends a message about how important our pool plays. You know, water's everywhere. Kids are going to get drawn to it. Yeah. We're a part of making sure we're promoting swimming and kids knowing what they're doing and educating parents because, you know, the drownings are happening all the time. And it's, I, I have a pool and it's terrifying when kids are there. And you just want to be able to do things right. But I think in the core of our community, we've got a pool where we're teaching, you know, so we can prevent it. That's the key. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And yes, that's a plug for our new pool. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now is the time for citizen input. Anybody wishing to come forward and speak to any item that is not already on the agenda, please feel free to do so. Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda where we have the approval of minutes, board and committee appointments to arts and culture, board of finance, local planning, and public safety. Are there any items to be pulled? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. Vice Mayor and Commissioner Gao, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And we'll move to um, our action items. Our first item is Resolution 2208, adopting the restated, restarted City of Dunedin Defined Contribution Plan. Nikki, would you please read that by title only? Yes, Mayor. Resolution 2208, a resolution of the City of Commission of the City of Dunedin adopting the restated City of Dunedin defined contribution plan, repealing all resolutions in conflict herewith and providing for an effective date. This has been reading of Resolution 2208 by title only. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes. Thank you. Teresa. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission. Uh, happy Public Service Recognition Week. Thank you all for your service. Um, just wanted every uh, resolution 2208, based as uh, our city attorney has said, is required by the Internal Revenue Service that all uh, retirement plans are approved by them on a regular basis. So we have a 401A defined contribution plan for our, our employees, and we have sent it to our attorney, Lowell Walters, for review, and he uh, put together the resolution. He, we have an IRS determination letter that is part of the packet that basically says that our plan is approved as to form. Any questions? Questions for Teresa? Um, you know, I, I, I read this, and it made my head spin. <laughs> so, I, you know, my bottom line was, okay, what's the bottom line here? Because it's a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. Totally understanding you have to conform to the IRS. Mm -hmm. So I think, and you can tell me, I think that the bottom line is it was revised to clarify that the forfeiture of unvested city contributions to an employer's retirement plan is immediate upon termination and the prior service credit will not count if an employee is rehired more than three years after termination of employment. I think that's the, the, the most important. Is that correct? Very good, Commissioner. Yes. It, Vice Mayor, sorry. Yes, it is. <laughs> Go. All right. <laughs> so it, the administrative process is that if an employee is not vested in the plan, and that's at least five years of service, that if they leave employment, uh, the, the money that the city has contributed contributed to their plan will be forfeited and go back to uh, our plan. And then if we sort of, you know, decided that our employees, we do have employees that come back. 
uh, from time to time. So we wanted to clarify that if an employee comes back within three years of employment, they would not have that money that they lost if they weren't already vested, but they would be able to credit the years of service that they had before they left. If it's within? Towards ve within three years, yes. Three years. Well, I know Mo will have a much better questions here. This is her bailiwick, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I actually don't have any, um, you know, familiar with the plan and seems like logical change and clarification. So, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no, I'm, I'm good with this. I was ready for the hour. I'm good with I this. Was, I, I, was, I was settling in. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good with this. When we get our play, pay plan review, oh, yeah. you'd be ready yeah. for that, but <laughs> not this one. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> sorry. Um, <clears throat> Anybody else with a question? Okay, this is public hearing. Anyone wishing to come forward and speak to this item, please feel free to do so. Seeing or hearing them, we'll come back to the commission. Um, any final <coughs> comments from anyone? Nope. Okay, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Gow? Aye. Commissioner Tornga? Aye. Vice Mayor Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Mayor Bajowski? Aye, and that motion <coughs> passes unanimously. unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just got in from vacation I, last oh night. I'm gosh. still kind of foggy. Know, I could make some additional comments if you want me to. No, <laughs> that's here. okay. I was ready. <laughs> All right, thank you, Teresa. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, now we have the uh, Edgewater Drive uh, Advisory Committee continuance. Um, Francis? And whoever else, come on down. This is something we do um, every three years with every committee, so nothing unusual. I'll turn yeah. it over to you. All right. Um, good morning, Mayor, good morning. Vice Mayor, Commissioners, um, City Administrator, Francis Leong Sharp, Planner 2 for the City of Dunedin, and I'm also the staff liaison to this wonderful advisor committee, the Edgewater Drive Advisor <laughs> Committee. And here we have um, this morning is Cece Lasky, our chair of the committee, as well as Mary Ellen Tilly um, that would like to present um, some updates of what the committee has done in the past year. But um, as you have mentioned, Mayor, um, this is a, an item for the continuance of the advisory committee. So um, I'll let um, Cece take it away. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be You're here. Welcome. I'm very lucky to be the chair of this committee. We're very lucky to work with Frances. I have to put that out right away. <laughs> um, she's amazing, in case you didn't know. Um, we spent a lot of last year, quite frankly, um, speaking to issues of safety and traffic issues on Edgewater Drive. Um, while that's not our whole charter, circumstances just seem to... Um, warrant that that be our focus. Um, I'm pleased to say that Francis helped us. The mayor also came. We were lucky to have Whit Blanton from Forward Pinellas. So we, we do feel very supported by the official people. Um, to, the end of, to that end of safety, we respectfully advised um, throughout the year that this um, speed limit on the full length of Edgewater Drive um, be reduced to 30 miles per hour south all the way to um, Union Street. The break at Lockley is creating a bit of a speed up opportunity. People see the change and they, they're just primed to whiz. Um, I have the great fortune to live right there and, I'm, and I love living there, but I also get to see a lot of the speeding and passing, unfortunately. Um, we also would hope that permanent um, your speed is signs be placed on the drive, um, it, it, you know, reasonable, Places um, we want to recognize that when um, with in um, in working with Teresa Smalling when I when I have communicated with her when she has arranged for um, Pinellas County Sheriff to come it's amazing it makes a huge difference and so um, we hope that the city can continue to work with the sheriff's department to enhance enforcement of speed limits and the no passing laws because when they are there they are a very effective presence and we understand they can't live there they, they have a whole county to patrol um, we also made motions regarding the placement of stop signs on bell trees at citrus bell trees in uh, Broadway and Florida, Broadway, and Orangewood, um, due to concerns about overflow traffic from Edgewater Drive affecting those streets. And we were told that the traffic engineer um, went out and took a look and didn't 
feel that stop signs were warranted at this time. And, you know, respectfully, we would bring forward that perhaps we do need to take another look at that considering the accident that just occurred with a bicyclist on, on Broadway and Orangewood. Unfortunately, <coughs> I don't know many details about it. I'm not trying to capitalize on someone's misfortune. I just simply want to point out that it was a dangerous intersection that the committee identified, and sadly, we were right. Um, and we, we have the same fears for Edgewater Drive, which the mayor also shares. I know she's spoken with us about it. Um, and the committee, um, we, we'd like to brag a little bit. We feel like we pushed the envelope on those crosswalks. We, we know they were part of the FDOT plan, I don't know, for 2023. Um, and, and we kind of banged on the table a little bit, and they're there now. And I, we understand the... the um, the overlay to make them a little more visible is coming as well. They're really working well, and we really appreciate it. Um, and for the future, we would like to get back to looking at the environment of the linear park and the trimming of the mangroves and our trash collection that we've organized before. Um, and we'd also, I'm, and I will write an official letter, but we would also love to be part of Complete Streets. Perhaps Bell Trees could be part of Complete Streets, and we could look at the whole picture. Um, we're here to help in any way. And we thank you for your support, and we hope you'll let us keep doing what we think is important work. And any questions, happy to answer them. Well, um, you know, I, I was wondering, have you, have you, do you have any feel whether the crosswalks help to slow it, anything down? I see people go across, and sometimes I see, I, you know, I see a lot of good people that stop, and then I see some really angry people that try to go on or that honk. Yeah. I mean, because I see it every day. So I, I, I'm wondering, first of all, I guess, when we might get the brick overlay, because we were going to get the pavement overlay in them. Mm -hmm. do, you, do we know when that's in the budget? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to check and get back to you. Um, but I'm just wondering, does that sort of, does it ameliorate anything? I mean, does it help when people know that there are coming up to areas where people there are crosswalk areas. So my anecdotal observation from the at the Beltree's Edgewater, you know, I can, you know, walking the pups and everything and going up and down is, it is the same as yours. It's very effective for some drivers, and others do speed through and seem, I don't know, at best oblivious and at worst on purpose speeding up. Um, I what I observe is people are very cautious about trusting that the lights are working. Mm. I know I am. I mean, I, I, I wait till I'm really mm. conscious that that car's slowing down. Um, I would hope that at least for people who are regularly using the drive, that it is a visual, constant reminder that this is a, a pedestrian area as well as a, dry, a, a commute route. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't done a scientific... I haven't, I haven't talked to people about it generally except for my own neighbors, so it would be interesting to maybe talk with people that are staying at the Fenway, taking a walk. Uh, my husband loves to chat when he's out in the yard. I'll tell him to start. Yeah, tell him to get in chat. <laughs> <laughs> Talks to everybody. Yeah. My apologies if you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Oh, and Mayor, Paul can fill us in on the brick, if you, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Morning, Commission. Paul Sanic, Public Works Director. Um, actually, it's something we discussed yesterday. So uh, it, it's definitely on our radar. Um, one of the things, and actually, I drove the causeway last night because they're going to be pulling up our, our brick imprints there um, and then putting down the, the new crosswalks, and then we're going to come back in and add the brick to those as well. Uh, even though they'd stated to us they were going to start on the causeway on April 18th, there is no work that has been done out there yet. So mm -hmm. we have, you know, economy of scale. We want to get um, all the ones that we have on, on Edgewater and Bayshore and those ones out on the causeway done at the same time. So as soon as they're ready, whether it's the end of this fiscal year or the beginning of next fiscal, fiscal year, we're going to get them all done at one time. Sooner. I'm Sooner rather than okay. later. We're, right we're, now we're, we're at the, you know, the mercy of the county and for when they're going to oh, be doing I know. Yeah, their work I know, out but there. But still, so. if, if, they, if we keep pushing and they know it's really important to do the causeway also. I mean, the entire, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it needs to uh, have s be synchronized, you know, with design. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And we've been working with them. So it just, um, like we have our own pavement management program, and, and, you know, we spend a lot of money on that, mm -hmm. and that's big mm -hmm. for the city. 
it's huge for the county. Mm -hmm. So they have, you know, yeah. one contractor, multiple crews working throughout the county. So kind of just whenever we're up on the plate, they're going to do the work. I also know they had some supply chain issues as well, and that's why we've been put off. And I have not been given a, a date for when they're going to be back out to actually start working on the causeway. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Okay, any other questions for these ladies? No, but uh, I just want to thank you guys. I mean, obviously, Edgewater is a really important corridor for us. Totally on board with the 30 mile per hour, and you have no better advocate because she is a dog with a bone when she goes after something. Um, What's so, working on it? I know, I know. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. But uh, thanks for all you're doing. Again, it's, it's a really important corridor. It's a privilege to live on Edgewater Drive. It really is. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Okay, so uh, we do um, need a motion to extend um, the Edgewater Drive Advisory Committee. So moved. Second. Vice Mayor and Commissioner Twonga, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. All right, and then we have the uh, proposed agenda. Um, everybody had a chance to take a look at that I did and I um, I had a couple of questions sure I was just really uh, happy to see the Clearwater st. Joseph sound interlocal agreement with Swift mud mm -hmm. is that been I mean I know we don't it's coming forward but I'm really happy and it is that the long-standing look at how the different tributaries come out and fall into the St. Joseph's and Clearwater Harbor, like Curlew Creek. I'm glad Paul showed up today. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm thrilled to see it on there. I mean, we yeah. Yeah, good morning again. Uh, and yes, it is. You know, it's, it's the ongo ongoing uh, research and data collection that we're doing That's correct. Um, for That's our impaired water. Mm -hmm. So it's a $400,000 grant well, four hundred thousand dollar project. Two hundred thousand of that is uh, from Swift Mud. The other two hundred thousand is from Pinellas County. I think at eighty-five thousand, and then a number of us cities that have joined in with them to do that work. So two weeks from exactly. today, actually, it'll be on consent agenda. So maybe this is a better time to talk about it. Yeah, but that's very exciting. So no, we're we're excited for that, and once again, working with um, Pinellas County, uh, it's you know we're all part of one watershed. So the MS4. So this is uh, very important for us and uh, Clearwater Harbor and St. Joseph's Sound. So. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, may I just ask a quick question, since Paul, since you're up there, uh, that involves the intercoastal, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and that would be, that's how we end up getting. If there's any monies that are going to be allocated to the intercoastal, then in our particular county, it comes from that. It, it would come from that relationship, and or by city, I would guess. Correct, correct. And since we're part of the, you know, the, the whole MS4 for, for throughout the county as well, so, you know, it, it kind of comes and sits with the county and, and then it gets spread out among all of us municipalities depending on what water body we're on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, can I have a motion to... I was just going to, I mean, better now than some other time, some other time, but I noticed that the Senior Hall of Fame actual... Um, awards breakfast is like May 11th uh -huh. and um, I think most of us are probably going to the chamber event that morning uh, is that the breakfast yeah breakfast and which actually I think they time out I already RSVP to go to the fallen heroes event that the sheriff's doing because he's got a new memorial up yeah so I was I was sorry they were in conflict um, I don't know I was gonna May call 11th Sam. yeah is he morning yeah, Where's so Heroes? it's right at the main Almerton place, and they've done a lot of work. Oh, yeah, it's it's yeah, going to be a very, very nice uh, I am going memorial to type. I'm going to the breakfast. And then the breakfast is at Mace? Right after the, yeah, right, but right after the breakfast is the Hall of Fame, so obviously, you know, just want to make sure we've got representation. At I'll both. go to the Hall of Fame, and then I'll go to Mace. I'll go to the... The I'm going to go to the breakfast because I can do both, go but I'm going, I've already RSVP for I'll Fallen go. Heroes. You have to. I'll go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's so probably what I'll do, and then I have to go to Forward Pinellas. Yeah, so okay. we'll have All right, so we'll have every yep. Please, you know, I hate to miss the Hall of Fame thing, but the Fallen Heroes thing is going to be very important as well. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So so, second. second. Whatever. 
Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner Franey, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, Jennifer, did you want to give us an update on this postponement? Yeah, the artisan incubator, the, um, um, there is a discussion regarding the location of the parking spaces. And the, it doesn't impact the deal structure itself, which is what we really wanted to talk to the commission about, but it does impact ultimately whether or not um, they enter into an agreement. First of all, we enter an agreement with, um, um, with uh, Mr. Davis and then with our tenants as well which is Archangels and the DFAC. So I wasn't really prepared, didn't really want to bring you um, the deal structure without having at least a verbal um, uh, consensus as far as that parking goes. I'm looking at the workshop schedule and you are busy all the way through July with some, some you know, pretty big items. So we're going to have to sit down with them and, and work that out. Can we make sure that we get um, the whole idea of a privacy fence that blocks that stuff in the back or something we need that so we'll addressed. talk to we'll talk to mr davis about that that's not required by code so it is going to be something over and above but we'll definitely talk to mr davis about that you mean the privacy fence at the north? so you can see recreational vehicles there and you're not supposed to see recreational vehicles they're supposed to be behind a blocking fence and they're behind a fence right and they're behind a fence but it's not a view blocking fence mm -hmm. um, I mean I think that was the intent of our our rule well we'll have to we'll have a look at it mayor yeah and convey that to them it's the same with his neighbor next door mm -hmm. with the boat yes. and the boat trailer which is still there by the way mm -hmm. how did I get in trouble I don't know you're, <laughs> you're not in trouble <laughs> they <kidding>. are <laughs> I just, you know, every time I come down there, it's such a revitalized right. corridor, yeah. and you see junk and junk. You know, I don't want to see it. Okay. And you're the city manager. You're yeah, always so in trouble. Happens, I mean, yeah. come on. That's the way it is. <laughs> that's right. Goes you know, and the job. bike people have done such a great job, and then you have junk. So get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Cover it up. Put a fence up. Do something. How about a tarp? No, that's I'm not good enough. <laughs> I am just teasing, just to make you mad. Mm. Okay, so we need to. <laughs> are we? Are we? Um, we don't have a date certain, so you don't do postponement. It's just table it for yeah, now. Yeah, it's not advertised, so we don't need a date certain. Okay, so can I? Can I have a motion to table it? I'll table until. Well, I wish. I hope that we can because. It ends in in September, so we're going to have to. So per per the agreement, uh, we give the need to give them three months notice. So we would need to know at the end of June. Okay. So, Second. So June's going. to, okay. That's what that's mm -hmm. what our yes. Okay, Commissioner Kynes and um, Commissioner Vice Mayor Kynes and Commissioner Tornga. Okay, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, I did not get notified of any commission discussion items. So city clerk's update, anything? I didn't hear from you. Anything from city manager? And I do, just really quickly, Mayor. Um, I want to call your attention to the fact that uh, the applications are open for the not-for-profits American Rescue too. Plan Act funding. Where is it online? Because so it's online. I was looking yesterday and couldn't find it. It's online at DunedinGov.com. It's right on our, our landing page. On the front page. Yep, you just scroll down and you hit on American Rescue Plan Act funding. So it, it is open um, until June 1st when we close. So it's open for a month, just under a month. We actually have this upcoming Friday at 9 o'clock. So that's May 6th at 9 o'clock, a webinar. Uh, and uh, Widow Bryan, who is our consultant on the American Rescue Plan Act funding, and Les Tyler will be um, uh, conveying the parameters of, of the program that we've put together. So um, the... Um, I think that's going to be very helpful for people to, to listen to that webinar. If they're able to, it'll be recorded. They can access it any time as well thereafter. Sure. So thank you, Mayor. That's all I had. Okay. City Attorney, anything? You know, I didn't have one until last night. So since we have a little bit of time, you all likely saw that the Supreme Court decision came down about the city of Boston's flagpole policy and how they did not guard their flagpole as a non-public mm -hmm. public forum. So we are going to be issuing, you know, looking at making sure that there's, if there's any city policies that need to be strengthened, 
My understanding is the city's practices are very different. So understanding that all of these cases are usually very fact driven. So um, my understanding is the facts are different, but the decision just came out last night. So we are reviewing it and the memorandum on that case, as well as a recent um, sign case out of the city of Austin will come to you all along with the legislative updates in mid-May. So we're finalizing those now. Thanks for the few minutes. I just thought I would let you know. Are you, you concerned about it? I think I just, oh, I've, I've tried to just summarize my, I think these are very ha heavily fact-driven inquiries. And my understanding at this point is means. it means it's based on what exactly Boston was doing. Very my specific. understanding is yeah. what, what, what the Dunedin's practices are different. So my takeaway, even though, so I can, I'll say it not legally. I saw it. I was concerned because one of the things it talked about was pride flags and we're ready to put our pride flag up in June. Um, but it did sound like, you know, they had potentially, who knows, I know you're going to look into that, you know, somewhat of a more liberal practice of different groups being able to fly different flags, et cetera. And, and so I think they used the term, uh, you know, didn't really have much control over it. Yes. So everybody did different things and then they tried to stop a church from doing it. That's my takeaway from what I read very briefly, but but I appreciate that because my takeaway too was it was very different that we that we don't have that type of a liberal practice. But again, I'm glad you're on top of that. I was going to ask you about it. I was concerned about it. My, my, my I thought so. Yes, Mayor, that would be my my understanding is that the the practices that the city <clears throat> follows are different than Boston. But for me to actually go down and dig into the city's policies. That's why we're going to prepare that memorandum and make sure that if there are any changes or tweaks or adjustments, we're able to make them. So I don't think we have any written policies. I don't think, well, and I, it's not even, it's yeah. right, yeah. bigger than practice, that. So, practice, but practice. right, exactly. And what was the second one? Nikki? There was a sign code case out of the city of Austin that actually, um, gave a little bit more understanding to the Reed decision that came down about content regulation and actually said, you know, there was, there, there was a very, very stringent reading that an on-site, specifying whether a sign was on-site or off-site was content-based because the test that people had been applying since the Reed decision was if you have to read the sign to apply the code, then it's content-based. So if you have to read a sign to determine whether it's on site, people challenge that as a content-based regulation. And actually the court in that case said, don't be ridiculous. We can specify on site and off site. That's specifying a location, not the content of the sign. So um, there was a little bit of reasonableness got sort of injected back into that, which is helpful for the project that we're beginning to prepare to bring back to your attention and looking at your sign code. So thought we'd let you all know about the update in that case too. And as you know, we hear a lot about that sign at the laundromat. Oh, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Even my grandchildren notice that, <laughs> <laughs> which is the exact people we don't want well, to notice absolutely. that sign. Okay. We have all kinds of colorful political speech. We live in interesting times. We do. Every day. I, <laughs> well, thank you, Mayor, for some sure. unplanned time, but those, those developments did just happen. So. No, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I saw it immediately. It popped up, and I was I was concerned. Yeah, that, that's really very interesting new budget. Mm -hmm. Already, uh, commission comments. We'll start with you, Vice Mayor. Anything on your liaison position? Well, I just wanted to uh, thank the Scottish American Society. They did such a beautiful job with um, the their special thing for the Ukraine. And thank you so much. Oh, I loved it, and little Olivia went up on stage with me, Aww. and she's very shy, so I was so proud of her that she nice. would do that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know I saw I saw all of you all there. I think you were out of town, yep. but I, I did see everyone there. We called there. her in, though, when it was raining. Yeah. But the only sad thing, because they worked so hard, and people were so enjoying it, and unfortunately, the rain came, I think, right around 5, and sort of right around because I was there or just 15 minutes earlier before the rain hit. So anyway, uh, all congratulations and thank you to all the people that came out. I think it just showed the kindness and compassion that people feel and that they truly do grieve for the Ukraine. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. Anything oh, oh, I had one other thing. Sure. Sorry. And yesterday I went to the um, 
K through 12 art exhibit, the Dunedin Showcase, mm, nice. and they were very kind, and they said you began it many years ago, that you started at the community center. It was packed. I mean, they that. were so excited with their artists and uh, it, some beautiful work. So if you have a chance, go down and see in the Children's uh, Art Museum, there is the whole gallery full of their works and just very talented kids, such excited parents, and fabulous art teachers. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. Nothing? I think I'm allowed to ask a question of the sure. city manager, right? I'm not, I'm trying to get clear on this stuff. Um, so uh, with the Edgewater Drive issue uh, committee coming up, what, what's the status on the setback? You know, the, the ability to do the setbacks to the houses and mm -hmm. I know we were working on that. Do well, the, we know? So, so the issue is that, that there's a setback in our code and there's a setback that's required on the underlying plat. Right. The city doesn't enforce Plat requirements. It's a, it's a private covenant on the property, so we would enforce the setback that's in our code. Most of those um, most of those houses obviously have built to the setback on the um, underlying plat, so it would be something that we would have to either incorporate it in our code, um, and, and certainly work with anybody who's building a home at that point to call that that underlying uh, requirement to, to their attention. And, and if I may, there's also one more thing we could do. And, and of course, Nikki, you'd have to look at this, but you know, if, if people along Edgewater Drive that have those very deep um, uh, front, which is not only, you know, people say, well, it's really nice because you have these deep setbacks, but it's also resiliency. If you think about right across the street, you have, you know, the linear park and the water. Um, but I think, it voluntarily, the people that have the, the deep uh, setbacks could voluntarily put in their instrument of, of uh, their deed or whatever that it is their wish that that be maintained. And that's a voluntary action. That's, I mean, Nikki, you have to look that up and see someone, uh, another attorney told me that. So that we could voluntarily say, if my house is sold, if it is torn down, I, I'm going to put it in my deed that I will vo that this this will sort of run with the land, but it's voluntarily each person would have to do it. Yeah, that's not a, that's interesting, but that's not a city question. Right, the right. The city can't require someone to. No, 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 no. I'm I'm just saying there's a enforce deed restrictions just Cor like in general. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But we could you could do that in a private manner. I know, I know what you're saying. Like I'm just an interesting thing that a lot of private lawyers can advise people on, but I can't. Right, but, right, 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 right. I don't know. I'm what just trying is. to say there may be other ways to go at this if there isn't a city way to go after it. Oh, I mean, and and plat restrictions are enforced by the fellow plat owners, so this is a private issue. If someone, this the city not enforcing a private restriction in a plat has nothing to do with what private parties can do to enforce their property rights against one another. And voluntarily. So it's, if, a, I mean, privately and voluntarily. Right, or if, or if a neighbor violates their plat restriction, it's the neighbor's but why, dispute. Why do, we, why do we not, why does, not we as the union, but why do cities not enforce what the plat because says. Because it's a private interest. It is a private requirement. It's a pri just like HOAs have private deed restrictions. Those are enforced by the HOA. They are not city. They're not city regulations. They are not. So and you once can't, you can't impose a different setback than allowable by your code. Um, the they're 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 private agreements between two parties. Just like the city doesn't enforce other private agreements in every other context, it's a private issue, not a public issue. The city regulates okay. through its land but, development. But I mean, I think the way we're looking at it, though, is it's it's not a a general issue. It's a development issue. So it's a building issue. So it would just seem that well, we approve the plaque. The city, right? That's why I'm trying. Right. To, right, we do. Your approval of the plats is not imposing a different setback than what's required. But if you want to change the setbacks of your code, then you change those in your land development code, in your government regulations. They are not, you don't, 
enforce private restrictions and there's there's by the way there's oodles of them some include plats some include you won't paint your house a different color some include you will use this building material i mean deed restrictions and plat restrictions are private agreements between private parties that just like other private agreements the city has no role in particip in but again we approve a plat at a formal yeah. meeting. So how does that not we make us a party? Approve them for technical check? compliance in accordance okay. with Chapter 177 of, of Florida our code. statutes, and you accept all public dedications right. in the plat. Okay. So public dedications and easements are different. You do enforce those because they have a public interest and benefit. And when you look at that language, that's what we're we're saying. Yeah, it could off meet or exceed over. our goals, but we're but saying. You know, the important thing is too is that this particular area was platted, I think, right around the turn of the century, and it has a requirement that no, you can't have African Americans. It's nineteen twenty. Yeah. What? There's a requirement that you can't have African Americans in that subdivision yeah, on that I underlying mean, plat. Yeah. It, so. And most of them do from that time. It is a terrible thing. <laughs> wow, I didn't mean to go there. <laughs> no, it is a terrible <laughs> thing. Yeah. But no, it went dark. It's not enforceable <laughs> by anyone after 1964. We know yeah. that. I but mean, that, it, but yeah, it's, it's but unconstitutional, again, but they're very old. Oh, what's plat. in a plat? And how far reaching deed, plat, right. and other private restrictions that private parties can choose to place on themselves, and that's their own private thing. But what's the public issue? And that's what the city is always looking at. We have technical requirements in the statutes that are reviewed and applied. We have the requirements of our code that it has to meet. Okay. But if they impose something extra on themselves, then that's for the neighbors to dispute out. if they don't if they don't follow. They don't like it. They have. And to. the city actually goes one step further, and in issuing the permit, if there are underlying restrictions and things like that, they issue a disclaimer to them. We are looking at the public these issues. If you do this and it in, ends up inviting a lawsuit from your neighbor, the city's permit is not giving you an authority to go out and not be sued by your neighbor. That could still happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a weird way of explaining it. But basically, they, the city gives people the, the <clears throat> information up front that you may need to go talk to your neighbors about what you're about to do because you may be violating your private plot restrictions. But, but if you're saying it's not per se public, then it could be a voluntary private thing among the neighbors. People choose, yes, people choose all kinds of different things to do with their properties and that, that don't involve the city. And that could be legally enforceable as between those two parties, but it's where is this, what's the city's role in involvement? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I yes. think we're, we're all That's maybe looking. And, you can, and if it's a setback issue, Mayor, then the way that the city regulates that is by amendments to the code. And so you all can amend your, your setbacks in different zoning categories. But keep in mind, you're amending it for, for the whole the zoning, zoning category. Yeah. category. Right. We treat everybody the same. Right. I can always tell when Jennifer has Unless an you do some kind of overlay. <laughs> can you do an overlay there? Back. Like a... Um, you can't at one it. time we were trying to do a historic overlay or something when John Hubbard was still here and we were talking about the Fenway and how far we didn't want the Fenway coming out too far either. That's a bit too hypothetical, I think, for me to answer on the dais, but the, you can do overlays. We still have to treat all similarly situated property the same. But our, our, also the overlay you just adopted says you can't lay an overlay over an overlay. That, that's true. So you'd have to be, it'd have to be, you could maybe do a historic district along, which would be different along Edgewater. I mean, I'm trying to look at all the permutations. I know people, uh, but again, I keep going back to maybe if the neighbors would get together and decide a private way that we could all agree that we would say, you know, if my house is sold or torn down or whatever, I'm, I'm going to put this in my personal restrictions that it will not that it will have this deep setback and i think to the mayor's point though that it, maybe we should get the committee together and have them call the neighbors together and well, have correct. this discussion yeah that's what i think and we you know i would be i'd have to talk to to um francis about notification helping them out with that too mm -hmm. but I have them get together at the Fenway or whatever and say, mm -hmm. would you be willing to look at this right. voluntarily? You went out first Question. on, Thank you. you know, remember, to President Street and said, would you voluntarily rezone at that time? Remember, we tried that before we went to the overlay. But I think this would be a sort of a community discussion about, you know, how could we privately handle right. this? 
if we cannot publicly do it. Yeah, and I think actually, uh, if I may, Mayor, that would be much better if, if the residents in the area facilitated that meeting, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, because, you know, the minute we do a direct mail notification, it's going to be our effort, and we don't want to do that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've, I've turned my mind around and around and around and around on this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the first time I really understood the legal separation, and I appreciate it. It helps me. So I at least, you know, then I can be educated when I'm talking to the residents there. So I, I get it. Anything on your liaison positions? Uh, no, nothing with Tampa Bay Regional Planning because of the conference, uh, the sustainability conference. We didn't have a thing last time. We have one Monday coming up. Toronto Blue Jays have fallen into second place uh -oh. below the Yankees, which is even more, you know, sorry. Any Yankee fans out there, I don't mean to. You know, be mean to you, but anyway, so we'll, we'll follow that. But no, nothing, nothing new on that. Okay. We're getting geared up for, I think, the chamber trip in June, so. Commissioner Tornga, any liaison position reports? Uh, yes, uh, Dunedin Cares. Um, in as much as uh, Dunedin Rotary Club North was doing a, and is doing a, uh, a fundraiser and a golf tournament in the Dunedin Golf Club on May 13, and in as much as, uh, and we're doing that for uh, organizations and activities that we support in Dunedin, and in as much as uh, Dunedin Cares was interested in also doing a, uh, a golf tournament, um, they have joined our golf tournament. So um, if anyone's interested in any fundraising for the Dunedin Cares and or for obviously then for the Dunedin Rotary Club, you can just look at either one of the Facebook pages or, or information from either one of those organizations. Uh, additionally, um, Dunedin Cares is still looking for volunteers for Saturday morning from 9 to 12, and, uh, and they're full speed ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Where at 9 to 5? Is it, I saw something that they're going to have something Wednesday at uh, First Press, so... Yeah they're, yeah, they're doing. They're continuing to do the churches. The PB and J thing. Yeah. Oh, well, the PB and J is is now over. Um, is up at my understanding, uh, but I'm not say that officially. I'm, I don't represent that exact information, but um, but but they are using the the churches, uh, the four churches here in uh, in Dunedin to help to help with the uh, not only the collection but then the disbursement. Sorry, I got nothing. I I think I gave you guys the blow down the last, the last meeting, so uh, I have nothing new. Um, so if that's it, we're done. <laughs> Look at well, that. <laughs> okay, then. Well, that's that's a, is that adjourned. an official close <laughs> cake? We're adjourned. I better say cake. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.